Hello, welcome back. In this segment, I will explain how we can turn the Elgamal encryption together with key encapsulation into a CCA secure system. In the previous segment, we talked about CCA security and the, the absence of CCA security in the context of Elgamal. So today I will explain to you how you can enable CCA secure uh, system using Elgamal and regular private key encryption scheme like AES, for example. Okay, so we have two parties, Alice and Bob, and uh, we want uh, Bob to publish his public key because he's the one who's going to receive the message from Alice. Bob will generate parameters to the group and um, the order of the group is Q. G is the generator of the group and we need a public key H and the private key X. Okay, so I'll only write the public parameters here. He, he randomly picks an X, right, from ZQ and he computes G, um, he computes G power X rather and keeps the X private, of course, publishes the H. Okay, so this is public, everybody in the world knows it. And you can imagine somebody uh, attestating the fact that this, these are the public parameters of Bob, okay? And uh, suppose Alice wants to send a message to Bob in the Elgamal encryption scheme. Uh, we talked about how to do that, okay? But there, were, there was a problem that if somebody modifies the ciphertext, uh, Bob will not detect that problem. So how do we resolve that? So Elgamal uh, encryption can be enhanced with this uh, very simple trick that I'm going to talk about. Alice will first select a random Y from ZQ. Alice knows Q because it's public, right? And she's going to compute uh, G power Y, let's call this a C1, right? And, uh, and then she's also going to compute uh, two things, hash of, okay? She's, I'll talk about the hash function in a moment. You can imagine there is a hash function, which takes uh, h power y as input. Alice knows h because h is also public. And imagine this is going to give uh, Alice a two n bit number, okay? Let me explain what n is in a moment, but let's imagine this is going to give back um, a two n bit number, okay? So I'm going to uh, model the two n bit number as follows. The first part corresponds to the, the key that uh, Alice will use to encrypt the message and then let me call it KE, this is the key for encryption. Uh, and uh, the next part of the, the key will be another key, let's call it the MAC key, KM. Okay, the two keys Alice is going to obtain by calling the H of, capital H of H power Y. Okay, uh, this is the encryption key, symmetric encryption like AES or something like that, she, she will use, this is for symmetric encryption, um, as E stands for encryption. And this is the MAC, key. This, this is the MAC key. Okay. MAC is the message authentication key. Okay. All right. So we have two keys now on the Alice side. Suppose Alice wants to encrypt a message. Now she will do as follows. She will compute the ciphertext C2 as just called, say, for example, AES is the encryption algorithm. It need not be just AES. It could be anything else, but I'm going to make an example AES. And of course, uh, both Alice and Bob have to agree upon the counter mode or GCM mode or whatever, and all the IVs and so on must be published. Um, I'm not talking about all the details of how AES works, uh, but we, for us, it's it's good to know that there is an encryption algorithm, say symmetric encryption algorithm like AES, which takes the key, KE as an input, and the message CM. Okay, that's enough uh, at an abstract level. Okay. And then she's going to sign this using um, quote unquote sign means message authentication code in this context. Uh, a tag, she's going to produce a tag, message tag, by calling the MAC algorithm. It could be HMAC or whatever that's uh, equivalent to HMAC. Uh, the MAC will be computed uh, using the key KM, which um, she received from the, this function H, right? And she's going to compute the MAC on the ciphertext C2, okay? Bob is going to get a few things. He's going to get C1, He's going to get C2 and the tag D. And now the question for Bob is, um, of course, he needs to reverse the C2 and extract the message. But in order to do that, he, he has to first obtain the key. So how is he going to obtain the key? First step for him is he has to first check whether C1 belongs to the group. Okay, this is the very first thing he has to do from validation perspective. If C1 doesn't belong to group G, then he rejects it right away because there are attacks possible 
if he doesn't do that okay so the first step is if if the element c1 doesn't belong to the group g reject reject it meaning um, failure is declared okay so usually in cryptography we write it with this notation to say failure let's assume c1 is belonging to the group and the question is how to construct the um, decryption key and the message and the math key and which is easy because all he has to do is he takes c1 and he computes c1 power x he knows the x x is the private uh, why will c1 power x works c1 power x is nothing but g power x y right because c1 is nothing but g power y so it's g power x y and this is exactly what alice also computed h is nothing but g power x so g power x y so both of them have the same um key ke and the mac uh, mac key okay so so the, the two parallel lines means concatenation. So the key is made of two parts. The first part is the encryption part, and the next part is the MAC key part. Okay. And the, such a H exists, we are assuming. I'll talk about properties of H in a moment, but assume for now such a H exists. Okay. Now, once the key is derived, a um, couple of things he has to do. He has to take the MAC key and check whether the MAC is valid. Uh, take the um, Mac verification algorithm, let's call it verify algorithm, which will take uh, the, the Mac key KM and the ciphertext C2. And if it is successful, then go ahead and decrypt the message by doing AES decryption. Let's call it AES inverse. Inverse function means decryption and use the KEC2. Okay. Only if it is successful. Only the MAC verification is successful, it'll go and verify, uh, decrypt it. Otherwise, let's say this is wrong. So something went wrong. Somebody modified the ciphertext or the uh, any of these three things. Then this will this will end up with the um, um, failure. Okay, that means some something is wrong. Some, say C two was modified along the way, a C two cap. Then this will be error message. Okay. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and decrypt it. All right. So this is basically it. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about the H function, right? The H function, you, both Alice and Bob must agree on that, um, should take a group element, right? And um, map it to a binary string, any binary string, um, let's say made of two N elements, okay? What it means two N, where, where is this N coming from now? N is the order of the group, okay? Uh, let, let me uh, rephrase this. N is the um, bit size of the order of the group. Okay. N is equal to how many elements in your binary representation of your um, order. Okay. So you can imagine, um, let's say you, you use a publicly available GQ uh, parameters. Uh, you can imagine um, G being um, Z star P made of 2048, uh, 2 port 2048 numbers. And you could work with small subgroup of order 256 bit, meaning 2 port 256 of possible elements. So your, your H must be mapping um, your element to um, 256 times 2, 512 bit, for example. Okay, if, if you choose your N to be um, 256, the H function will give you um, a 512 bit output, okay. So you can use uh, HKDF, for example, uh, to, to achieve this. That's not difficult to do, okay? So in any case, um, we are assuming such a random H function avail is available. If the function H is a truly random function, like a so-called random oracle, uh, then um, you get a CCA secure scheme because the attacker in order to break the scheme must compute C1 power X, right? What is C1? C1 is nothing but G power Y. So the attacker knows G power Y, which is publicly sent. There's nothing but um, C1, right? So he knows this, this is G power X. The attacker also uh, knows H because H is public. H is nothing but what? Um, G power X. So the attacker knows G power X, G power Y, but um, we assume that uh, it's difficult to compute G power X, Y, okay? If we assume like that, then then the scheme is uh, secure from a chosen ciphertext perspective. So if, if somebody modifies C1, what will happen? Uh, let's say they modify C1. Well, in that case, um, the key 
they will get out is wrong because the hedge function will behave like a random function. So they're going to use a wrong key and a wrong Mac. So the Mac will uh, very likely fail or uh, yes, that's basically it. So Mac will fail that you will not go ahead and, and decrypt. Okay, so to sum up, what we've shown today is that you can turn your Elgamal um, encryption into a CCA secure um, encryption scheme, um, like the way I explained with the assumption that the function H is a random function, okay? It can um, take any group element and map it to a binary string of 2n in a uniform um, context, meaning any um, random 2n bit number will be coming out if you call the function H. And it should be impossible for someone to um, obtain the hash of g power x, y from g power y, g power x. Okay, that's basically uh, we are going to assume like that. If such a H exists, um, we believe something like HKDF. Uh, could, could could help then we can uh, perform this uh, scheme okay that's all thank you very much